Welcome to To The Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. And what a week. Presidential election, as of this taping, not yet decided, but leaning heavily toward former Vice President Joe Biden. Joining me to discuss how Biden did with women, how women did in the Senate and the House, and the women's vote overall are Donna Edwards, former member of Congress from Maryland, Democrat, uh, Hillary Rosen, Democratic strategist, Patrice Lee of the Independent Women's Forum, and Linda Chavez, CEO of the Center for Op Equal Opportunity. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Hey, Bonnie. You're doing great. All right, let's get going. Um, first of all, just before the taping, Hillary, you were talking about how white women versus women of color went for Biden. Uh, t tell us about that. What's the breakdown? I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this election is going to be saved again by women of color. And, you know, for, for white women, it's like the the women we enslaved are saving us from tyranny and God bless them. Um, because uh, white women went 55% for Donald Trump over 43% uh, uh, for Joe Biden. Um, black women went 90% for uh, Joe Biden. Latin uh, uh, Latinas went 70% for Joe Biden. Um, we would not have this victory without uh, women of color. And, you know, in, a, in an interesting way, the gender gap has widened with white women and this election. Um, it does show that for all of this terrible narrative that Hillary Clinton suffered about how women didn't support her, that actually having a woman at the top of the ticket brought out more white women uh, to support her. But we have a lot of work to do in our party uh, with white women across this country. And how are you going to do that and talk about racial justice at the same time? Well, I don't think white women are against racial justice. I think that white women and um, uh, black women have, you know, much more in common. We care about our families. We care about our opportunity. We care about, you know, health care. I think that we have created a significant amount of division in this country due to a president whose interest it was to sow that division. And I think we just need a more concentrated effort by women across aisles to say this is not good for our families to have this kind of division. Um, but, you know, it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge we have faced in multiple elections for um, to encourage white women to think about economic opportunity differently, to think about sexual harassment laws and um, equal pay laws and other things that bring them uh, to the table in a way that the Republican Party doesn't. So, you know, I think that's our challenge. Linda, as a Latina, uh, how do you see, wh how do you explain that 70% of Latinas voted for Biden and 30% for Trump? Why is that? What was the determining factor? Well, of course, you can't really talk about Hispanic voters as a single homogenous group. Voters in South Florida, uh, the Cuban Americans, Venezuelan Americans, Nicaraguan Americans uh, were very, very persuaded by Trump's, you know, socialist message that if somehow if the Democrats were elected, it was going to turn uh, Miami-Dade into uh, Caracas. I don't know. It was, it was a, I thought it was a, a bad argument, but I was wrong. Um, but now, let me also say about Cuba, it, it goes because my grandfather was Cuban and all of that, my family fled Cuba after Castro. Um, they turned Republican because they're very anti-Castro. Castro took everything from my grandfather that he had spent 20 years building up in Cuba. And they just see it completely differently from how, for example, Mexican Americans see it. That's exactly right. Now, but you know, what is amazing to me is that you have a president who has been viciously anti-Hispanic. I mean, he was, he has been just unbelievable about Mexicans, Mexican Americans, you know, calling in a Mexican American judge, not an American essentially. And yet you've got a large number 
of Hispanic voters, including Mexican Americans, who voted for Donald Trump. But so, that was mainly men, and that was because, uh, I, at least according to what I read, that was because they like his machismo and his bravado, and they were drawn to that. Uh, why would why would they be drawn to that and not pay attention to the things no. he was saying that they are rapists and murderers? Well, you know, I I do think Bonnie that uh, coronavirus was a huge issue in this campaign. I think Democrats believed that was going to redound to uh, Joe Biden's benefit, and I think it it did, but. For certain segments of the population, you know, if you are a small business person, uh, a, a you know immigrant who's now a citizen or even a Mexican American, et cetera, and you've got a small business going and your business has been shut down, your concern may be mostly about opening up that business. And I think that ended up helping uh, President Trump more than I thought. And, and you know, just so so viewers not be confused, you know, I am a Republican, I am a conservative, but I voted for Joe Biden. Why is it that once again, uh, all but probably single white women, they will, my guess is single white women will have voted uh, by large margins for Trump along with women of color and married white women are the ones who pushed the majority vote of white women to Trump. Why is that? Well, this has been a decades long struggle of trying to figure out um, why it is that white women vote the interests of their husbands and partners and um, the men in their lives and, and black women, women of color vote the interests of their families, they vote their their self-interest um, in terms of economic and other uh, issues, and, um, and they are pragmatic voters, you know, who's going to make a difference in the lives of the people in our, our communities. And um, once again, you do see women of color, particularly black women, holding up uh, the Democratic Party. And in this instance, perhaps, transforming the election, even by a slim margin, from uh, Donald Trump to Joe Biden. Um, I, I actually think that one of the things we need to start taking a look at is the gender gap that's taking place between Latino men and Latinas and between Black men and Black women, um, which is that those gaps are seem to have grown uh, with Donald Trump. And I think that we need to take a look at the kind of messages that uh, the Trump campaign, I think, was very effective at continually bombarding them with messages. Look, he never sought to get all of them. He just needed a sliver of them. And that's what he was shooting for. Okay, and but let's, let's talk about post-election now. Um, we've got, you know, obviously a huge movement of of act, of all people, uh, people of all colors, but in support of Black Lives Matter and looking for all kinds of reforms from changes in police training to defunding the police to um, all kinds of programs that uh, is are not going to help Democrats with white married women. How is Joe Biden going to navigate that? What policies Quickly, please, are we going to see in him try to pass that will get both African Americans and white married women, even white married men, uh, back into the Democratic fold? Well, I mean, I think he's going to focus on rebuilding the economy by, you know, shutting down the virus, just as he said at the outset. I think he's going to focus on creating jobs that, you know, go across the um, across the economy. These are things that are important to men, women, black, white, uh, in terms of taking care of their families. And that's no that's no different. I mean, I, I was very inspired, frankly, by young people. The number of young people who came out the between young black men, young black women, black women, uh, Latinas, all under the age of 30, who came out overwhelmingly in support of Joe Biden. That's a vote for the future. And so, you know, I'm not going to stay, you know, focused on how it is that we need to try to get women that we haven't been able to get for 40 years. 
Um, and I'd rather focus on how we can bring along these new voters who are going to be the millennials and the Gen Xers are going to make up the majority of the popula population. Joe Biden had a tremendous appeal uh, to this new group of voters. Bonnie, I'd love to take a few minutes to respond to so many things that I heard today, which is uh, amazing. Number one, I would think a lot of my white female friends who voted for President Trump and, conserv and, and support conservatives are insulted to say that they're doing so because uh, their, their husbands told them so, or they're doing so because of their husbands. You know what, there are many women who are business owners for themselves and make the calculation that pro-growth policies of deregulation of tax cuts are better for them than, uh, than increasing regulation and increasing taxes. Uh, when, I, when I look at immigration, when I look specifically though, at Hispanic women and Hispanic men and black women and black men, I actually see that Hillary Clinton did better among black women than Joe Biden did among black men, so far, uh, black women so far. There has been an erosion slowly of black women away from the Democratic Party because they feel, not surprisingly, uh, that there have been promises made that were never kept. And I think with Hispanic women, you're also seeing an in support by pres for President Trump because, again, these women are thinking about businesses. They're thinking about their economic situation. Well, and and right I, I believe the you're absolutely right when it comes to educated women of color. But when it comes to white women who supported Trump, I know lots of them in the horse world. I own a horse farm in Prince George's County, Maryland. And most of those women are financial, whether you want to say that this is the reason or not, but they are mm -hmm. financially dependent on their husbands. And they have more what so-called traditional, some would say passe marriages where the man is the, you know, they're religious, the man is the king of the house. Bonnie, this is like fighting words from you. <laughs> you know, you know, Bonnie, we all sort of made fun of uh, President Trump when he made that appeal to women saying, I'm going to get your husbands back to work. Uh, I mean, there is a kind of strange genius that Donald Trump has. Um, it, you know, I, I think it's underappreciated. I don't certainly don't appreciate it, but he does speak to a certain segment of the population and he energizes them and it didn't work enough for him, I think, to win this election. I still yeah. believe Joe well, Biden will win. Let's be clear well, that he's appealed to a very large part of the population, which is why the, the, the blue wave did not materialize, which is why we haven't seen the turnout that we, that was predicted by the polls and by a lot of the pundits on television. So well, you know, I think as, as we the, had the largest voter turnout that we've ever had and, in this country. Blue, but, um, so, but the blue wave that was supposed to change and, state uh, And swings in states. You know, when you take a swing in a state like Wisconsin that went from, you know, 20,000 under for underperformance for Democrats uh, to 60,000, that's an 80,000 vote swing in one state. Let's, uh, let's wrap up and talk each of you a little bit. And we're not talking about President Trump as having one re-election because at this point in our, when we taped the show, it looked like uh, it, there were several states that had not been called yet, but it looked like uh, Pre uh, Vice President Biden was going to win. Well, let's start with you, Hillary. What policies are the Democrats, um, especially assuming that the Democrats do not win even 50 votes in the Senate? Um, it's That's unclear right now, but it looks unlikely. Um, how is how is Biden going to govern and get policies that the people who voted for him put him in office to put in place? Look, I think this is a very challenging time to have um, President Biden come in with such a um, uh, a, a tight, you know, um, margin in the Senate, and and Mitch McConnell still deciding what gets to the floor and what doesn't get to the floor. Um, I think the the House Democratic margin is still pretty wide for for governing, and Donna can speak better to that. By the way, shout out to the Republican women who've elected thirteen new Republican women this year. Um, they really made an effort at doing that, and I'm all for more women in office, regardless of party. So, um, but I think what we're going to see from Joe Biden is two things. First of all, people forget that unlike Donald Trump, Joe Biden actually wants government to work. 
He actually believes that government can work for the people. And I do think he is going to work hard to heal this country. And that means being more bipartisan than pa perhaps people on either ends of the party might be interested in being. What, is, what does that say for let's just finish on, on a couple of for points. reparations? Let, let me just... What, is, is he going to go for reparations? I, I think I think there are a series of issues that are going to be stuck, right? I think a climate initiative is going to be stuck. I think that um, who knows what happens on things like gun control? Who knows what happens on things like um, voting reform, which is so desperately needed right now? But places I think you will see him move quickly and can, I think, get bipartisan support will be on a new stimulus that includes some things like um, reform for policing departments and federal support for more thoughtful community uh, engagement with police that will include education support and other things. I think there are Republicans in the Senate who will go for a package with Donald Trump out of there as long as it brings enough to small business, it brings enough to you know rural and, and suburban communities. So I think there's room there. I think Joe Biden is going to work hard to find that common ground. He really has no choice. Health care, in my mind, is a big one. Republicans in the Senate have egg on their face for the last four years because Donald Trump never gave that replace bill for Obamacare he promised, depending what the Supreme Court does. Health care, a bipartisan effort on health care, is going to have to be a huge priority. All right. All right. We got to switch. We're running out of time. Let's... Uh switch to the Senate, first with the Senate. Um, this is being called the year of the Republican woman. As as Hillary mentioned, Patrice, I want to go to you. But as Hillary said, there were 13 new House members, Republican women. Um, talk about the gains in the Senate and, and the seats that were held in the Senate by Republican women and why this is the year of the Republican woman. Absolutely. So you're talking about now eight Senate seats held by Republican women. We saw um, only one Martha McSally lose her uh, seat in, in Arizona, unfortunately, but you saw uh, others hold on to their seat. Joni Ernst um, certainly was one of those that held on. Uh, Susan Collins held on to her seat as well. I mean, I think that there are you know, a number of women who were outspent by their Democratic challengers by significant amounts who are still able to uh, to to survive. And I think it's because they align themselves with um, in some some of them with President Trump and with his policies. Um, you know, I can't underscore, though, what we're seeing now is we're going to have 31 women, Republican women serving in Congress, which is a new record. Uh, and that's fantastic. I mean, I applauded in 2018 when we saw new records for all women uh, in, in serving in Congress. But I think we saw women, uh, flip, Republican women flip seats. Uh, we saw them also unseat incumbents. And so that tells us something about how the how Republicans, particularly led by an effort by Elise Stefanik out of New York to recruit women, to re recruit minority women, um, to recruit people and, and also women, people who are veterans. And so it was a successful strategy. I hope to see more of this. Um, and and I, I think, you know, again, I brought up the blue wave that didn't happen. What we did, though, see is a lot of energy supporting Republican conservative women. And I think it's it's great to see that the Republican Party is not just all white men as has been painted, but actually people, women, minorities, people with veterans, uh, Hispanics, um, the, this is a party that's saying, you know, the policies are actually really important. And yes, there are people who look like you who are also are serving in leadership. Can, okay. I, can um, I just interject here? Because I think it needs to be mentioned. One of those Republican women who uh, appears to have gotten elected is a QAnon uh, fanatic. And I think that's really too bad. And I wish that uh, she would be less welcomed with open arms into the Republican Party, because that is a disaster. And she's from Georgia. Right. And then Donna Shalala, the former HHS secretary under President Clinton, was beaten in Florida by a conservative, some would say very conservative uh, Cuban American woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Donna, what your thoughts on the year of the Republican woman? Well, first of all, like Hillary, I always celebrate when more women come into Congress because I think um, it would be nice uh, for Democrats to look over on the other side of the aisle and see more women because I think that's a, that's a governing change. Um, but I also believe that 
Um, you know, Democrats have to be disappointed in their performance in the House races and in the Senate races. And so that's going to mean, you know, some at least rethinking about strategy going forward and um, and figuring out ways in which Democrats can actually be more supportive. Some of the races that were lost were really, you know, talented women who were lost. And I think that we have to think about ways to invest in those campaigns um, more and strongly so that we have some survivors out there in these tough districts. And, you know, Hillary, in wait, terms just, of, oh, wait a second, in terms of who uh, won the presidency and, uh, and assuming it's Joe Biden, of course, I was thinking there couldn't be a better Democrat to try to deal with a Republican Senate than he, him because I, I covered Congress in the 80s and he was, I covered it when he was chair of judiciary, uh, when, when he, in the Clarence Thomas hearings, he really annoyed a lot of progressive people in the party, but you would think maybe gain some points with conservatives in the Senate at that time. I mean, he started out as, as a good old boy from Delaware and he's changed a lot in the last 40 years. But uh, is that going to give him points with the Mitch McConnells of the world? Well, I don't I don't know that we can applaud anybody trying to cover their ass in the Anita Hill hearings. I think all of the men on that panel did. Um, so I, I don't know if it gives anybody points or not. But I know that Joe Biden is committed to bringing this country together. And if working with a Republican Senate to get some things done uh, is the way to do that. No one will know how to do that better than he. And let's not forget his amazing vice president, Kamala Harris, who also served in the Senate and has good relationships across um, the aisle and, and elsewhere. And look, um, I think that, you know, we've now spent um, 20 minutes talking about politics and we haven't actually mentioned the fact that we are about to have for the first time a vice president who is a woman, who is a uh, a proud uh, woman of color who brought so much energy and so much enthusiasm, particularly among young voters, as, as Donna talked about, to this ticket. And I think we are going to see, you know, a whole host of differences that she will make going forward. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, quickly, go on that. What do you think? What will be her special issue? Will it be the law because she's former AG uh, of California? Uh, will it be uh, minority issues? What 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 will she take on the way the way that um, uh, uh, Mrs. Obama took on education and veterans? Well, she's the first lady. She doesn't need a cause. Right. She's and also, she. Right? I mean, she has a background. She ser she served on the Intelligence Committee and on Judiciary. She brings a lot to the table. I think to be a good advisor for the president uh, to to be that navigator on Capitol Hill that. Uh, that I think that he's going to need to be able to navigate uh, the relation, some of the relationships he had previously, but that she has uh, currently. Um, she's going to be a great partner for him, and we're going to see that. And I don't think she has to have some special portfolio because she has a multi range of talents that are going to be brought to bear in this administration. Bonnie, and, can I just and, jump in and I, say, you know, I think Trace, what, when it comes to um, to to her as a vice president. Uh, potentially, I know I think she's going to have to overcome her record, which is very far left. And a lot of conservatives have pointed that out during this election cycle. And so if she's going to be able to bridge that gap between conservatives and and the far left of the party, as well as where she stands, uh, she's going to have to prove that she's not just going to be cowing to uh, the very far left wing, which a lot of conservatives are not going to go along with. I don't think she has anything to prove. I think they're going to be in governing mode, not proving themselves mode. And so that that means working with everybody and it means getting things done and means being a good partner to Joe Biden. All right, Linda, 30 seconds. Uh, well, Kamala Harris, what the impact of Kamala Harris? Uh, well, it remains to be seen. Some of it has to do with, you know, how vibrant and healthy Joe Biden remains. Um, I actually know people who voted against Biden who might have been willing to vote for Biden because they worry that he won't fill out his term. So it remains to be seen. I think in terms of her liberal record, you have to remember that she was the senator from California, the most liberal state in the union. Uh, so we'll see how liberal she turns out to be. And 
I don't think going to the left is going to help her. I think she needs to be more in Joe Biden's image. Okay, that's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Thank you so much for all the insight that you gave our audience. And please follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And please visit our PBS website at pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.